Man is in a hopeless, helpless condition. Verse 23, there's no difference. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've come from. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's God's indictment against all mankind. In the book of Revelation chapter 5, as we come into that heavenly scene, Actually, we're brought into that heavenly scene, chapter 4, as John sees the door open in heaven and he's caught up and sees the throne of God, the cherubim about the throne of God, the 24 elders on their lesser thrones. And then John sees a scroll in the right hand of him who is sitting upon the throne, sealed with seven seals, writing within and without. And John heard a angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals thereof? And John said, I began to sob convulsively because no man was found worthy, either in heaven or in earth or under the seas, to take the scroll or even to look thereon. The scroll is the title deed to the earth. It's that scroll of that gave forth the terms of redemption. And no man was worthy to redeem himself or to redeem other men. Man is totally helplessly, hopelessly lost. And that's where we find ourselves at the end of chapter 3. No difference. We're all there. And it doesn't matter how lost you are. You're lost. Well, he's more lost than I am. <laughs> you know, we oftentimes sort of solace ourselves with the fact that, well, I'm not the most sinful person. But the problem is, we're all sinners. And degree doesn't matter. The Bible says if we keep the whole law, yet if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. Again, it says, Cursed is the man who continues not in the whole law to do everything that is written therein. So the fact that we have violated, and it doesn't matter which commandment you violated, the fact that we have violated God's commands makes us all sinners. But unable to do anything about it. The law has pointed its guilty finger, the law has pointed its finger and pronounced guilty. Now, as we get into verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. Now we get that work of God in our behalf. Justification is not a state that God gives to me. It is something that God imputes to me. God has accounted me as justified. God looks at me tonight as though I had never, ever been guilty of a single sin. Justified freely. There is a mistake that we so often make in our relationship with God. And that is, we somehow feel that we've got to persuade God to forgive us or to persuade God to love us. When in reality, the love that God has for you is so full, so rich, that He freely bestows His love. You don't have to do anything to make God love you. 
He already loves you. What you need to do is to come into harmony with that love. God loves you supremely. And all that God has done for you, He's done for you freely. We so often find ourselves begging God. Oh God, please. You know how much I want your help. You know how much I need your help. Please, God, as though God should be implored by us. If you only knew how freely God's grace and mercy has been extended towards you. Just as you are. Now, I think that a lot of times in our interpersonal relationships with other people, we sometimes feel insecure and we don't know if they really like us or not. And and we're constantly probing, well, do you really like me? And then we're doing oftentimes dumb things to find out how much you do love me. Do you love me even if I do a stupid thing, you see? And, and it's always, well, honey, do you love me? Well, honey, uh, do I look nice? Or honey, you know, and it's, it's probing for love. Expressions of love. And, and somehow we seem to play little games where... Well, you know, you treat me right and you say the right things and you look right and I will love you. And so there's that striving and attempting to earn love from each other. And sometimes we sort of carry that over with God, thinking, well, I've got to somehow earn God's love. I've got to do something that will cause God to love me or cause God to love me more. No, You don't. God loves you so supremely. My little grandson, William, is a little rascal, (laughs) smart as a whip, probably too smart for his own good, because he's always figuring out the angles. And, of course you learn to be careful how you answer because he's, you know, like an attorney. He'll ask you a series of questions, but you don't know what he's leading up to. And he gets you, you know, answering, and then he'll close with his uh, little logic, and you end up in the toy store buying him a new gun, you know. (laughs) And... He is a little fellow who bears watching because he is prone towards mischievousness. And his Sunday school teacher one day in correcting him said, William, God is watching you as though God were a policeman watching for him to violate the law in order to give him a ticket or arrest him or throw him in jail. And unfortunately, so many times we think of God in that light. God is watching you, you know, and, and um, more or less as, as an officer just waiting for you to violate the law. And so when William got home from Sunday school that day, And as they were eating lunch, he turned to his dad and he said, Dad, is God watching me? And Chuck says, well, William, why do you ask me that? (laughs) His father's pretty sharp, too. And William said, well, I was doing something in the Sunday school class today and the teacher caught me and she said, William, God is watching you. And I just wondered if he was watching me. 
And Chuck said, yes, William, God is watching you. He watches you all the time because he loves you so much. He just can't take his eyes off of you. Yes, God is watching you. He's watching you all the time. Not to arrest you, not to condemn you, not to bring the wrath down on your head, but he's watching you because he loves you so much. He just can't take his eyes off of you. And we need to be thinking of God in that light rather than as an officer. There is one thing about the written word, and that is that you lose a lot because you can't hear the tone of voice, and so we imagine tone of voice. And in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had disobeyed the commandment of the Lord and had eaten of that fruit that was in the midst of the garden, and the Lord came down to commune with Adam in the garden, and he hid himself because he realized that he was naked. And God said, Adam... Where art thou? Now we read those words in the Bible. And so often we read a tone of voice that we have heard ourselves when we were in trouble and trying to hide. And our dad comes in and says, Where are you? You know, wait till I get my hands on you. You know, I just discovered what happened outside, you know. And we imagine God to have that kind of tone of an arresting policeman ready to handcuff the victim and haul him off to prison. But when God said, Adam... Where art thou? I think if you hear the tone, a voice of a sobbing, heartbroken father, you'll have more the truth of what is being expressed there. It's Adam, what have you done? Adam, where are you? And it's just that heartbroken father when he sees the tragedy that a child has brought upon himself. For God loves you. He loves you supremely. You can't cause God to love you anymore. His love for you is supreme. It can't be any greater than what it already is. God will never cease loving you. And God freely bestows his love upon us. And God freely has justified us. It isn't that I have to prove to God that I'm worthy of, of his grace or to prove to God that I'm worthy of uh, his love. Not at all. God loves you tonight. And notice who he's talking about. All have sinned. Who's God's love and grace extended towards? The sinner. The Bible says that God has commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. So many times we, being aware of our sins and being conscious of our own failures, we, through the consciousness of our guilt, alienate ourselves from God. And we think, well, God surely can't love me. Look how I have failed God. And we're so disappointed with ourselves. And we're so upset with ourselves. And we think, well, God surely can't love me now. Look what I've done to him. Look at, you know, the mess that I've made. And God surely doesn't love me now. Oh, but he does. He doesn't love you any less.
freely. All that word durian in the Greek. And it, it's such a beautiful word. It, it just speaks of that flowing forth of God's love. Unrestricted, unrestrained, fully, freely. And so being justified freely through grace. God is oftentimes more anxious to forgive us than we are to be forgiven. There are many times when in a particular stage of sin, we have not yet tasted the fullness of that particular sin. We're in that initial exciting state when it seems very pleasurable and very exciting and we haven't yet begun, begun to taste the bitterness and we haven't yet begun to feel the sting. And we find ourselves sort of avoiding God because I really don't want forgiveness. I, I want to plunge in a little deeper. I want to indulge a little more. And God, looking down, is so patient with us. Now he knows that before long the old trap is going to spring and you're going to start screaming when you start feeling the pain and the consequence and the result of what you're doing. And you begin to cry out in agony. Then you want forgiveness fast and bad. But so often we think, oh, I've got to beg God to forgive me now. No. The justification that God has towards you is just freely. And the basis of it is not your worthiness ever. It's not because you've promised God you're never going to do it again. It's not because you've made all of these glorious promises to God of all you're going to do for Him to make up for it. But the basis of your justification is His grace. So many times we think that we've got to drive a deal with God. Now, God, if you'll just forgive me, here's what I'm going to do for you. And we're making our deals with God. And we start promising God all that we're going to do. Oh, I'm going to be so faithful, Lord. Oh, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. We were called out one night in Corona to this ranch. And the old rancher thought that his wife was dying. And he called us out to pray for her. And as we started to pray for her, he started praying, and oh God, if you'll just heal my wife, Lord. And he started telling the Lord all the things he was going to do. He was going to be the most committed man that God ever had. Serve him, you know. He was going to give God everything. And, and telling God all, and God, if you'll just, and, and making, or attempting to make a deal with God. You don't have to. God loves you so fully, so freely. And God's justification is so full, so rich, that he doesn't require deals. In fact, it doesn't add anything to it. In fact, it sort of takes away from it. Because in your endeavor to give God an excuse and in your promises that you are making to God, you are seeking actually through promises that you're not going to keep anyhow to convince God to do something for you that he had planned to do all the while because he loves you. And what God does for you is never done as a result of your promises or your vows. Now, in the early years of my Christian experience, I used to make all kinds of promises to God. 
I used to make all kinds of vows. Lord, if you'll just do, here's what I'm going to do for you. God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And make all these promises to God, all these vows that I've made to God in, in years gone by. God, I'm never going to lie again. Oh, God, you just get me out of this and I'll never do it again. Oh, Lord, I'm going to read ten chapters of the Bible every day, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm going to pray all the time. You know, and, and all these promises and all these vows that I made to God. But as I matured in my Christian experience and as I began to discover the grace of God, I quit making promises to God. I don't remember too many promises that I kept, for one thing. And every time I break a promise to God, I feel even worse. Oh, God, I promised you I wouldn't do it. I'm so sorry, God. And I'd always feel worse after the broken promise. So I've come to the place now in my Christian experience, I don't promise God anything. I don't have to. God loves me. God has justified me freely by His grace. Not through any promises of what I'm going to do for God or, or whatever. It's just freely as the result of His grace towards me, not of my faithfulness to Him. You see, as I have developed in this understanding of the grace of God, not only have I quit making God promises in order to try to get God to do things for me that I desired to be done, but as I've discovered the grace of God, I've just come to the place I expect God to bless me. Though more and more I am keenly aware of my own unworthiness of those blessings. For years I came to God on the basis of my goodness or my hoped for goodness. I grew up in a very strict environment. Where we were not allowed to go to shows, dances, not allowed to smoke, and you know, very strict, severe environment. And I, I'm not complaining. I thank God. Oh, I I am so grateful for the things that the Lord shielded me from. The fact that God did keep me. I'm thankful for that. But. It had its problems, and I had, it took me a long time to work through them. Because I was such a righteous little prune. <laughs> never going to shows, never smoking, never dancing, never doing, you know, any of these sinful things. I would oftentimes come to God on the basis of, well, Lord, you know that I don't smoke and I don't dance, you know, and I don't do all these things. And because I don't do these things, then, Lord, you know, you ought to be giving some special favors this direction. And I could not understand why when the numbers were drawn out of the hat that mine was never the winning ticket because I was, you know, never smoked, never danced. And, never, and, and that kid that won, man, he's got a mouth that's horrible. You know, he's always cursing and, you know, he's... Smoking and all this kind of stuff. And, and I had a hard time relating to God. I used to fast. And 
and then think, well, God, surely you ought to bless me now because after all, I've been out there fasting all week long and just praying, and now, Lord, you really ought to bless me. Quite often when living in Tucson, I'd go out into the desert, take a jug of water and my Bible and notebook, and a camping cot. And I'd go out there and just spend time worshiping God, singing to the Gila monsters. (laughs) Fasting and praying. And I'd come back home Wednesday afternoon so I could take the Wednesday evening prayer meeting at church. And I think, oh, my Lord, you really ought to bless this prayer meeting tonight. Here I've been out there all, you know, this week fasting and praying. And, oh, God, you're just going to really bless these people. Boy, I'll tell you, I'm going to really, you know, do a job tonight in the Word and all this. And I would be so weak from fasting (laughs) that I'd get dizzy standing up and I couldn't collect my thoughts and I couldn't think straight and I would have trouble expressing myself and all and the services would just be miserable. And I would say, but Lord... How can you do that to me? Let me make such a miserable flop of that message. How can you do that? Because, you know, I'd be out there, boy, I had to have my outline perfect by, you know, just all day long and and, and all just waiting on the Lord and outlining and, and receiving. And God was pouring into my heart, but I couldn't relate it. I couldn't get it out. I just, my mind was too fuzzed. And I think, oh, you know. Because I was expecting on the basis of what I was or what I had been doing. And I was coming to God on that basis of my worthiness to receive. Because surely I am worthy because this is what I have done. This is the commitment that I have made. This is, you know, how much I've given, Lord. It was interesting, though, there were other times living in Tucson where it's the, you know, the main route from here to Texas. And we had a lot of friends in Texas that I went to school with out here in Los Angeles. And so as they would be driving to Texas, Tucson's the first night out, you know, and So we often, we had people dropping in on us always. And so often, just about dinner time, because that's just about the time they'd arrive from L.A. And and so there would be times that I was planning to really get my sermon down in the afternoon, you know, and really get the thing sharpened up and ready for the evening. And uh, friends would drop through on their way to Texas. And I, you know, you'd sit and talk and talk, and I would get nervous because, man, I've got to preach tonight, and I don't know what I'm going to preach on yet. And, you know, I had my texts and all, but, ooh, I don't know what I'm going to say. And, and you, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get up in front of people if you don't have anything to say. And, you know, they'd stay on through dinner. And um, so many times I would, I would go out and I hadn't had a chance to really study and get my thoughts all in order. And I'd say, Lord, I'm so sorry that I haven't had a chance to really, you know, I always like 
to get together with the Lord the afternoon before I speak um, and just spend the afternoon in the Word and, and just waiting on the Lord and all uh, to receive from Him. And when I would get robbed of that time, I'd say, well, Lord, I, I just have to depend on you tonight because, oh, I haven't had a chance to study. Lord, I really am so sorry. And you know, some of the finest messages I ever preached were those which were just sort of impromptu, in a sense, just anointed of the Spirit. People would be blessed. People would be saved and touched and all. And I think, wait a minute now. That's not right. Here when I've been fasting and praying all week, you know, is dead. And here I've been cutting up and having a great time with my friends on their way to Texas. And I haven't had time to study and pray and wait upon the Lord. And man, the service would be fantastic. And I sought to sort of analyze this because it wasn't once, it was many times that this happened. And one evening as I was on my way into the pulpit, having just said goodbye to our friends as they were on their way to Midland, and I said, oh Lord, you're just going to have to help. I just have to depend on you tonight. And as I was saying that, suddenly it hit me. There was the key. You see, I had been depending so much upon myself, upon my research, upon my studies, and not depending as much upon the Lord. I've been depending upon the fact that I was fasting and I was righteous and I was all prepared and I was all prayed up and, and everything else, you know. And I was depending upon me, and every time I'd depend upon me, it would go flat. But whenever I'd say, well, Lord, I just have to depend on you, it would go great. And so the Lord just was teaching me that it is His grace and my dependency upon Him and His grace, not upon my righteousness or what I have done or what I've been doing for the Lord or what I want to do for the Lord, but just depending upon His grace and His love, and things would go great. And, and, I've, and I've discovered this to be a truth of life. And so I don't depend upon my goodness, my righteousness, my devotion, my commitment. I've learned to just depend upon the Lord and His love and His grace and His faithfulness and His justification and all that He has done. And so I expect God to bless me, though I know I don't deserve it. I know I'm not worthy of it, but that isn't the basis of God's blessing me. God doesn't bless me when I'm good, when I'm worthy, when I'm deserving. Well, let's reward him. Look how good he's been this week. Let's reward him now and give him a real blessing this Sunday, you know. No, it doesn't work that way. God blesses me because he loves me and he wants to bless me. And I've learned that. Now, for a long time, I wasn't letting God bless me. You see, if the blessings of God come upon my life because I am deserving the blessings, then most of the time, the blessings of God are held back from me because most of the times I don't deserve them. And the blessings of God are bestowed upon me by not my worthiness, but just by my believing and trusting God to bless me. That's the basis. Now, I could not believe God to bless me for so long when I, in my mind, knew I wasn't worthy of the blessing. In fact, though not expressed in exact words, there was always that underlying kind of, well, oh Lord, if you don't bless me, I'll surely understand it. 
because I know that I have failed you. I know I don't deserve anything, Lord, and so I just don't expect anything, Lord, you know, because I know I don't deserve anything. And so many times I would not even expect God or, or, or even come to God. I wouldn't even ask God to bless me because I knew that I wasn't worthy or deserving the blessing. And how many times you have been robbed of God's blessings that He wants to bestow upon you simply because you feel that you're not deserving or worthy of it. Because you feel the awareness and the consciousness of your failure and of your guilt and of your own sins. And you, well, surely God you know, doesn't want to bless me. That's wrong. He does want to bless you. Yeah, but I've been so miserable. I've yelled at the kids and I yelled at everybody, you know, and all of this. Hey, it doesn't matter. God still wants to bless you. Freely, by His grace. By His grace. Through the justification. Freely by His grace, which is through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. People make a tragic mistake when they try to make a sharp distinction and division between the Old and the New Testament. I meet some people say, well, I never like to get into the Old Testament. You know, I, I think that the New Testament is for us, and I just sort of leave the Old Testament alone. That's tragic because you'll never really understand the New Testament until you have a good foundation in the Old Testament. You can't really understand the word redemption unless you know its foundation in the Old Testament. The idea of redemption is always gaining back something that was lost. That's the idea behind redemption. And because man is always losing things, God weaved into the whole Jewish culture the concept of redemption. It's so sad to lose something. And because man is so prone to lose things, God sought to weave within the culture itself the whole thought of redemption. It is possible to gain back that which has been lost. If a person would lose all of his money, he could sell himself as a slave. And if you once sold yourself as a slave in order to pay your debts, in any other culture other than the Jewish culture, you'd had it. There was no way you could redeem yourself as a slave. But God established within the law that hope of redemption even for a slave for if you were sold as a slave, you'd only have to serve for six years. In the seventh year, you were set free. It was the year of redemption, and you were automatically set free. And so it was just incorporated into their very structure, social structure. If you had to sell your property... There were always those documents drawn up whereby in a specified period of time you could redeem the property again. You always had the buyback rights. And it went even a little further than that. The buyback rights extended to the family. So if at the end of the specified period you personally could not buy back, then a family member could move in and buy back so that it was never lost completely. 
without the idea that the redemption and the possibility of redemption is there. So many times you'd be forced to sell property. You'd be in a pinch. You'd be forced to sell your property. But within the contract itself was the whole aspect of redemption. You can always get it back. You may lose it for a while, but you can always gain it back. It can be redeemed. Now, it carried over unto man, and to man's sin. That which man lost through sin. There's always that possible of re- possibility of restoration, redeeming. And so it was set and incorporated within the very laws of the land, the whole concept of redemption. So as we come over into the New Testament we find that which was set and established by God in the Old Testament is now understood more fully in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf in redeeming us from our lost sinful state. You see, man originally belonged to God. But man, by his choice of sin, was lost. He became a slave. He became a servant to sin. He became a slave of sin. Man could not free himself. But God provided redemption where you no longer have to be a slave to sin, where you no longer need to be lost. But God has provided for the redemption whereby man who was lost as the result of his sin and had become a slave to sin can be set free from sin and brought back into fellowship with God. And that's what redemption is about. Now, in the redemption, there was always the price that had to be paid. There were always the stipulations which involved the price for redemption. So, with your redemption, there's a price involved. A price that you could never pay. but a price that Jesus paid for you. And so we read in Peter's epistle, For we are redeemed not with corruptible things like silver and gold from our empty life, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot or without blemish. So your redemption, the cost of your redemption, was the death of Jesus Christ. Through the shedding of his blood, the price was paid that you might be redeemed in order that you would no longer need to be a slave to sin or lost from God, but you can be freed from the power of sin And you can have glorious restoration and fellowship with God and all of the benefits of that fellowship. So the grace that is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the price has been paid for our redemption. But yet I am not fully redeemed. At the present point, the only thing that has been redeemed is my soul and my spirit. But I'm still living in an unredeemed body. And that's where my problems lie. And so Paul in the 8th chapter said, We and all creation groan and travail together, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, to wit, the redemption of our bodies. 
I'm waiting for uh, this body to be re- redeemed, which, of course, God really is not going to redeem the body so much as just give me a new body. So here I am, a redeemed soul and spirit. But I'm dragging this old carcass around still, this old dead carcass. And everywhere I go, I have to drag it with me. And every day, the quiet clay seems heavier and heavier to grow. But, One day the redemption will be complete when my soul and spirit depart from this body and I move into that new building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, as long as I am in this body, I'm going to have conflicts with my flesh. And the flesh is going to be warring against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these two are going to be contrary. And I'm going to have to deal with the flesh. I can't just ignore it. The flesh is going to try to usurp authority over my life again. It's going to try to bring me in its, into its bondage again. But I've been redeemed. Now, the day is coming when the redemption will be complete. The redemption of the earth. Jesus has paid the price, but he has not yet taken possession. In Hebrews, again, it says that God has put all things under him, but we do not yet see all things under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. But we wait for that day of the redemption of the earth. For he paid the price not only to redeem me from my sin, but he paid the price to redeem the earth from the curse and from its cursed state. And we're waiting for him to come and claim that which belongs to him. Lord, I belong to you. I'm waiting for you to come and claim me. Lord, the earth, you purchased it. You redeemed it. And we're waiting. The whole creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for the Lord to come and claim that which he redeemed. Now, I think that it is extremely significant that in the laws of redemption, there was that six years and then the seventh year being the year of redemption or release. And as we look at the earth, it was just about 6,000 years ago that the earth went under the power and authority of Satan when Adam sinned. And so that time of redemption is just about here. In the book of Revelation, we find a beautiful picture going on into chapter 5, which we mentioned earlier this evening. The scroll, the title deed to the earth. As the angel says with a strong voice, who is worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals? And no one is worthy. No one can redeem the earth. Man can't redeem the earth. He's been trying. And I'll tell you, it's still a mess. Look at how many politicians have promised they were going to redeem the earth. (laughs) Man has been endeavoring to do that for so long, and the earth is in a worse mess than ever. Closer to bankruptcy worldwide than ever. Now, in the book of Revelation, as John is weeping, because if the earth is not redeemed, then it remains in Satan's power and in Satan's hands forever. The angel said to John, Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to take the scroll, and he will break the seals. And John said, I turned and I saw him as a lamb that had been slaughtered, and I watched him as he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who was sitting upon the throne. Get this scene clearly in your mind. 
By the grace of God, I expect to be standing there in that company in heaven. I expect to, to watch this whole scene unfold up there in God's kingdom. To hear the angel as he proclaims, Who's worthy to take this scroll and loose the seals? And I see that scroll with seven seals in the hand of God as he sits upon his throne. And the silence in that awesome moment when no man in heaven, earth, under the sea can step forth. And then looking to Jesus, watching him as he comes and takes the scroll out of the right hand of the Father. And when he does, the 24 elders who are there about the throne of God take their little golden bowls with incense and they offer it before God. And they then we begin to sing. Worthy is the Lamb to take the scroll and to loose the seals, for he was slain and has redeemed us by his blood. Redemption. He's redeemed us by his blood. The cost? He was slain. He has redeemed us by his blood out of every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign with him upon the earth. And then is when the redemption of the earth, that whole transaction that we're waiting for and longing for, will take place. He takes the scrolls and he begins to loose the seals. As he breaks the seals, God's judgments begin to fall upon the earth as God is renovating the earth to prepare it for the return of Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 10, as John then beholds this strong angel clothed with the sun and the moon, the rainbow about his head, coming with a scroll that is open, and he stands putting one foot upon the earth and one foot upon the sea, and he proclaims that the kingdoms of this earth have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he takes the authority, and he begins to rule. Then will be answered our prayers, thy kingdom come. Then will redemption be complete. The whole picture of redemption will then be complete. But Paul here speaks of the fact that right now God has accounted to you a not just a sinless state or, a, 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 you know, as though the old is still there in the records. God has wiped out the records on your past. They don't exist. You are justified. You stand before God perfect and complete in Jesus Christ. You couldn't be any more righteous than what you are in Christ Jesus in your standing before God. You couldn't be any more pure. You couldn't be any more holy. But how can God account me that way? It doesn't seem right that God can just account me to be righteous when I know I'm not righteous. I know I do sin. I know I do have bad thoughts. I know I do fail. How is it that God can account me righteous? And if God can account me righteous, then why doesn't he account everybody righteous? Why does he still account some to be sinners? It doesn't seem fair that God can say, well, I account you to be righteous and you are still in your sins. How can God really be fair in accounting some people righteous? That we'll get into in our lesson next week as we get into the fact that God is just when he declares us to be righteous. The question or the problem is, how can a just God forgive sins? And if you think that over, you'll come to the conclusion it's impossible for a just God to forgive sins. If you think it through. And yet God has forgiven us our sins. 
How could he do it and still be just? That's the problem that Paul faces and answers in our lesson next week as he speaks of his righteousness that he might be just when he justifies those which believe in Jesus. We'll also get into that business of propitiation next week. It's a very interesting word. Father, we thank you tonight that you love us. Lord, we thank you that you have freely loved us. We thank you that you have freely bestowed upon us that justification by your grace. And Lord, we thank you for that redemption that you've purchased us. We're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We belong to you. God, help us to realize your claims upon us, having redeemed us. And may we, O oh God, relinquish what claims we may be making upon ourselves or for ourselves. And may we just acknowledge, Lord, that you are indeed the Lord of our lives, and that we are yours to use as ever you want or see fit because you've redeemed us and we belong to you. Lord, we're glad that we belong to you. And we gladly submit ourselves to you tonight. Having been freed from the slavery of sin, now, Lord, what a joy to be your servants and to serve in this glorious liberty of love that is ours in Jesus Christ. Lord, drive the truths home to our hearts tonight. Those, Lord, that have been wrestling with their own failures, those that have been defeated so long, those that have become so discouraged because of the weaknesses of their own flesh, those that have been trying so hard to please you but yet are aware, Lord, of their own failures, those who have been trying so hard to get you to love them, Lord, help them tonight to just realize that your grace is so freely given, and that your love is so freely bestowed. And may they just receive God, even though they're not worthy. May they just receive your love and your work tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.